It's always a treat to have Ben read. Thank you so much, Ben. As Ben so eloquently read, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. What does this mercy mean? Does it mean that they were asking for financial assistance? Or did they recognize Jesus as the one who could cure them of their disease? At our prayer breakfast, the first Sunday of the month, sometimes we study the healing stories of Jesus, and we dive into the scriptures to find some clues about the setting of those healing stories, as described in the book of Luke, and we compare them with the synoptics. Sometimes they're in Mark as well, or they're in Matthew and sometimes they're in John. So we look at the nuances um, found in each of the scriptures when they're available. And as a collective group studying the scriptures, we are able to better understand these healing stories as we gain insight from the perspective of those participating. We go deeper into the setting to the point of feeling like we were actually there with Jesus as he takes action to heal the sick and cleanse the lame. If we look at this healing account in Luke of the ten lepers with the intention of finding some clues as to the deeper and more profound details than we would if we simply skimmed over the scripture, we will see that the ten lepers recognize their place in the company of Jesus. They addressed Jesus as master. This meant that they humbled themselves before Jesus. They recognized him with more than just his name, Yeshua. They recognized Jesus as master. Jesus' response telling them to show themselves to the priests had several layers of implications. First of all, Jesus was giving the authority to the Levites, whose duty it was, as ordained by God, to provide cleansing in the form of a ritual. We could then ask some pertinent questions about the response or the lack of response from the nine lepers that did not give thanks to Jesus. Was the thought on the mind of the lepers that by showing themselves to the priest, they would then have to pay the priests by offering sacrifices of goats, sheep, or turtle doves. Or was Jesus telling them to show themselves to the priest in order to show them his divinity by healing them simply by the word? We don't know Jesus' motives, and maybe they were multifaceted. What we do know is that Jesus had compassion on them. What we do know is that Jesus did not hesitate to cleanse them of their leprosy. Way too many times I hear Christians, I hope none of our members, but I hear Christians make the comment that God gave them a sickness, God gave them a sickness, in order to make them stronger. That's just not a biblical point of view. In fact, it is anti-Christ. Jesus never, and I repeat, never brought a sickness on anyone. Jesus only ever cured people of their diseases. There is no place, I repeat, no place anywhere in Scripture where Jesus asks for help and he declines their request. Just doesn't happen. As Christians, we need to stop blaming God for our problems and start realizing that Satan is the one who is in the midst trying to mess, mess things up for us. I discovered a new show called The Next Step, Being a Dancer. It's um, a really great show for me to watch. And season one was they were going to the regional competition, and then season two they were going to uh, the national competition, then season three they were going to the international competition, and I was just watching season three, 
And as part of the prep for internationals, they sent uh, an exchange student from England into the next step dance studio. And then one of the next step dancers had to go to uh, Sweden. She, she um, went to the troupe in Sweden. So the girl from England finds this girl in the troupe, Ella. I mean, I'm sorry, her name is Ella. Finds one of the dancers in the next step troupe, Riley who has some self-esteem issues and goes to town on trying to ruin her life by pretending that she is Riley's friend. She zeroes in on Riley's deficits of being impatient, waiting for her boyfriend to finish his band practice so they can rehearse their duet for the upcoming competition. Ella gets into Riley's head and causes her to do things opposite of her character. They are far from wise decisions, but that is the intention of Ella. This is exactly how Satan works. God's intentions for us are to be whole human beings who love God and want to worship Him and worship Him only. But Satan sometimes gets into our heads and tries to change how we think about God. Satan wants nothing more than for us to stop coming to church to worship him. He might say something like, you don't need to go to a house of worship to worship God. You can worship God right at home. Yes, you can. But how often do you think people who actually say that they can worship God at home set aside time each week to worship God at home? Coming to church to worship is a spiritual discipline. Corporate worship is intentional time set aside each week to specifically give God our thanks and our praise. It's similar, like, similar to going to the gym to exercise. How many people purchase those exercise bikes thinking that they're going to exercise at home and then they end up in the basement or wherever just collecting dust? Many, many people do that. Other times Christians might ask, why did God allow this to happen? I can't believe in a God who would allow a little child to suffer. John touched on this uh, question a little bit during the adult Sunday school class. And um, the response to this ideology is longer than I have to explain in a sermon. But the condensed answer is that God loves us so much, he's willing to give us freedom. We are not puppets that are commanded to worship him and be good little angels. Trying to help my dad recently, I was on hold with the pharmacy for 20 minutes trying to get him a prescription. During that time, a recorded voice kept saying, we're sorry for the inconvenience, but we are assisting other customers. We will be with you shortly. I see some of you smiling. You must have heard similar messages from an answering machine. The recorded message does not have the ability to feel sorry. It's just a recorded message. And during the 20 minutes that I was on hold to speak to the pharmacist, this recorded message spit out, I'm sorry, at least 120 times. I have to be honest, it got really irritating. God doesn't work that way. We are not designed to spit out redundant shouts of pre-programmed praise. God gives us the ability and the choice to come to worship and give him thanks. Or give him an excuse like, Sunday morning is the only time I have to sleep in. As we can see from declining churches, Satan is beginning to win the battle. Satan doesn't have to convince us that God is evil. Satan just has to put little voices in our thoughts that we don't need God. We can get along just fine without him. He's been playing that trick ever since the beginning of humankind with Adam and Eve. 
Satan wants all of God's children to be like the nine lepers in today's gospel message. But those of us who are here are not falling for Satan's trickery. Yes, we can worship God out in nature. It's wonderful to do that. Yes, we can worship God at home, and especially when we're sick or for the shut-ins who aren't able to get here to the sanctuary. It's nice that there are programs on TV where they can actually feel like, feel like they're still connected to a church. But yes, we need to be in community where we worship God together and are accountable for our actions. And we grow in our faith. We need a place that can help us unpack the nuances of the scriptures and provide meaningful insight. We need a place where we can lift up our praise together and know that we are not walking on this journey alone. Everyone here this morning in this sanctuary is thanking Jesus just by being here. You may have thought of it as coming to worship, but in that process of worship, your praise gives thanks, gives thanks to God. Taking time to worship means that you appreciate what God has given you. And in the process, we give acknowledgement to the one who gives us life. I would not personally ever want to take a chance that I might take God for granted and forget to give God the thanks that he deserves. This morning we gave Evan a Bible because he is entering an age when the reading of scripture is vital in order to arm him with the power of God. <clears throat> I had a conversation with one of our members recently how when we grew up, going to church on Sunday morning was a normal thing to do. You know, that's what we all did. We did that together. It's what our friends did. Now it's not. So Ben and Evan and all of our children really need to be armed and know that they are part of a bigger community, that they're not out there alone as Christians. It's time for Evan to do, develop a spiritual maturity and have access to the meaning and the purpose of life. It's time for him to prepare himself for a journey where many other activities will want to compete for his time together with God. God doesn't ask us for corporate worship, worship seven days a week. God doesn't ask us for corporate worship even for eight hours on the Sabbath. But God does ask us to keep the Sabbath holy, to set it apart for him. To set aside time for worship because giving thanks should be a spiritual habit. Whether our habits are good or bad, like making our bed every morning or throwing our dirty socks on the floor, God gives us the ability to make those kinds of choices every minute of every day. God loves us that much that he allows us total freedom to choose. He doesn't lock us up inside the church on Sunday morning. He allows us to take side trips to the Phillies game or birthday party or soccer practice. But sports is temporary fulfillment. It won't get us into heaven. And it certainly does not give us the gift of eternal life. If we truly want to be happy and feel a sense of purpose and joy, then Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way anyway, so we might as well follow him every day. That's why we're here, to strengthen our relationship with God with the same enthusiasm that we would go on a date or a trip with our boyfriend, our girlfriend, or our spouse. God is our Father, and He is just waiting for us to talk to Him 
and to tell him how much we love him. Now is the place and now is the time. Amen.